Thank you so much. Um, okay, hello everyone and uh, welcome to this talk. So it looks like I can't move because I need to be here. So um, I work for, uh, so yeah, before that, yes. Welcome to this talk about how to use uh, open source to grow your career or how to make open source work for your career. And um, disclaimer, this talk is based on my own experiences. So, <laughs> you know, they are not universal truths, just my own experiences and uh, my experiences in working with the community on like, you know, what works. So currently I work for a company called ByteDance um, in their open source program office. Um, I'm not allowed to put that on the slide, but maybe people know about ByteDance. How many people know about ByteDance? Five, six people. Okay. <laughs> uh, maybe you, those who know can tell about ByteDance because my PR would not uh, approve for me to put that on the slide. So coming from you, it should be okay. Uh, yes. Yes, that's our claim to fame <laughs> in the Western world mostly. But like uh, apart from TikTok, TikTok apparently is only one of the apps, right? Like uh, it's only 20% or something like that of our revenue. Uh, our apps uh, are uh, like, you know, they interact with almost 2.5 billion people. And there was a Harvard Business Review article on how ByteDance became one of the most innovative company and like, you know, how they innovate. Uh, because most of the projects, open source projects that came out of ByteDance was, came out of, have you heard this term, eat your own dog food? Yeah. Right? So basically, most of these projects were used internally and it's because, you know, we integrate all our applications. Uh, this slide deck that I'm presenting right now is uh, presented using an app called Lark. Anybody has heard of that? It's like, you know, Teams meets Slack meets um, Workday meets Travel app, whatever, like, you know. So it's a productivity app which includes everything, right? So most of the open source projects that we have have come out of our own experiences. And uh, in uh, this QR code, it's throughout on my slide deck. So you'll find uh, my LinkedIn contact there. Uh, if you want to work with our, uh, us in our de developer community, you want to, um, we, we hold webinars about these open source projects. We have our annual developer summit coming up in San Jose in November. So all of those links are there. Some of the open source projects GitHub repositories are also on the, you know, the link tree. So about me, I belong to their open source uh, program office, uh, program manager. I'm also at the Linux Foundation Edge Governing Board. Um, some of you might have heard me in the panel in the morning, if you are one of the early risers. <laughs> if you're not, I forgive you. <laughs> yes. Um, so ByteDance has 50 plus open source projects and I advocate from that for them. Uh, my colleague from China is also here. In, at this conference, not right now in this room. Um, so they work uh, in the China and Asia PAC ecosystem, and I work out of US, uh, so non-Chinese audience. Uh, fun fact, I be started my career as a network software engineer. So I, I used to code for something called network processors. Has anybody heard of that? Maybe I'm dating myself now. <laughs> Um, and I started my career by reverse engineering the code to see what our network, so network processor architecture was because there were no documentation for that. And that started my journey into um, being a strong advocate for documentation, for processes, and that actually led me into where I am today, uh, but I'll not get in. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit later. Fun facts about me: How many runners in this room? Show of hands. Nobody. Nobody runs. 
Okay. I guess I started running when I was dealing with a teenager. <laughs> How many people have dealt with a teenager before? So dealing with a teenager in US uh, when you are your own chauffeur, your own cook, um, house cleaner, and full-time job, it's challenging. Because like, you know, uh, 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 and we had, I had to get into family therapy. And there was a time when like, you know, the therapist like, oh yeah, it's teenager's job to shout at you. But you are the parent, you have to be, you know, calm. And I'm like, oh my God, it just seems like a marathon. And that's why I started doing marathon. And uh, I'm blessed that I'm in Bay Area, um, blessed and also cursed. Blessed because, you know, Bay Area, if anybody, anybody has been to Silicon Valley? Yeah, 50% of public land uh, in California is reserved for us. So that means uh, anywhere you stay within three miles, you find a really good trail. You're cursed because you pay for that through your noses. It's a very competitive space. You have to earn a lot to live there. <laughs> so um, running became my uh, antidote to stress, to corporate stress. And uh, yoga was the thing that helped me run. Um, and I'm also an artist. So, oh my god. Oh, the, the format just went. I don't know what to do with the format. It looked good on my screen. Uh, I hope you can forget, forgive this format now. So, um, has anyone seen this diagram before? This Venn diagram? No. <laughs> you relate? Okay. Um, tell me how you relate. With, it makes sense. Money, talent, passion, mm -hmm. and especially happy but poor. <laughs> 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 yes, so this, this is all like, how many of you have actually done Venn diagrams in school? Yeah, a few people, yes. So you can imagine, right? So there is an intersection of talent and money, intersection of passion and money and passion and talent and intersection of all three, right? Um, so a show of hand, um, in your career where you are today, how many of you feel you're making enough money today? Nobody. <laughs> okay, how many of you think your talents are being used adequately in the career that you're in today? Okay. How many of you feel passionate in the work that you're doing today? Oh, more people. Okay. Four. So, <laughs> um, so I guess that explains why all of you are here. Right? So uh, what I see from the crowd is Nobody feels that they're making enough money in the career that they're today. Some of you feel that your talent is being adequately used in the career, some of you, a small sample, and twice of that feel you're passionate about it. So that's actually good. So the, the small audience who feels their talent is being adequately used are also passionate. Because the same two people who raise their hand that their talent is being used also raise their hand that they are passionate about the job that they're doing. Right? So, um, so when, so basically, what you want to be is like this is there is research behind this, and actually, my own manager when I started my journey in open source, my own manager showed me this Venn diagram. He was like, "Where are you today, and how can I?" get you into the intersection of all the three. How many of you have managers who would have that conversation with you? 
one. One, two, three people. My advice is stick with that manager because that's a rare breed. <laughs> Most managers don't understand that and that's, that's a sad thing. Now, so why are we here in this talk today? Clearly, most of the audience is not getting their uh, needs met in the current job. Right? Um, you're at the open source conference, so that's, that's really good. Um, so, uh, well, I was hoping, well, I, I did the same talk at Google Developer Fest. So there, a lot more people raised their hand for that they were making money, which would make sense because, you know, Silicon Valley. <laughs> uh, uh, but, uh, well, so this, this is like, you know, uh, research behind it that, like, you know, money can make you happy, but only so much. Beyond a certain point, it cannot. It, as long as your basic needs are met, met money is something that is just a tool. That is not uh, something that will give you happiness. What gives you happiness is work-life balance, right? Open source probably can't give you that uh, because that will be something you will maybe do over and above the job. So we'll keep the second thing. The third thing is what I would talk about, like you know, job variety and how to use open source to learn new things and to how to exercise your autonomy. That is what I'm going to talk about because that has been my experience. Um, so the, the, the second bullet point that you see here, uh, there was a research on like, you know, uh, employees of nonprofits and uh, how many of you think nonprofit employees make money? Yeah, not much, right? But then happiness index was really good in the nonprofit, like people working for nonprofits. Because they, they felt that they were contributing something, they were passionate about the work that they were doing, and perhaps they had autonomy. So, um, yeah, again, the Venn diagram is completely off the chart. So we want to get into that speed, sweet spot where you are making some money, your talents are being used, and you are passionate what, about what you're doing. Oh my God. This is <laughs> completely gone. So there are three quadrants in the open source that you can use. So 99% um, so of talent is outside your organization. How much of you think that's true? Yeah, four hands. <laughs> so this is a quote from uh, Dharmesh Jani from Meta. And I'm, you know, um, stealing that from him. Uh, uh, how many of you have heard of a term called duocracy? Yes, two people. Uh, do you want to say what duocracy means? Yeah, yeah, uh, that, that is sh for sure one of the things. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so in addition to that, uh, so, and a lot of open source projects have that, is if you ask for something, you do it. You get to do it. It's like, in any, any voluntary organization. Um, so in the morning I talked about uh, that I started my career in networking software, which I also mentioned right now, right? So how many of you have experience in networking? I mean, it's not a test, just asking, okay, a few people. Have you heard of a project called DPDK, open source project called DPDK? No, okay. Um, 
So this was a project or this is a project which is now a, a de facto standard in the industry. So, sorry, uh, did somebody say something? Sorry. Um, so if you have heard of networking, you have heard of virtual switches, right? Yes, two people know about virtual switch. Um, has anybody tried to configure a VM or a container? Quite a few people, right? So there are network interfaces, there are switches that like, you know, put traffic in between these containers. Um, so back in the day, before virtualization, there used to be actual switches doing this thing, right? Now, it's all happening virtually. How? Because of DPDK. So when I started, in, so what DPDK does is it uh, bypasses the Linux kernel and it lets um, even a CPU act as a packet processing machine, like a you know, virtual switch, it could be a router, it could be a, like any kind of network proto protocol can be con configured using DPDK. Where, uh, 2016 was when I started working with Intel. Uh, Intel was one of the key contributors to DPDK. And in the open source community, it was, Intel was synonymous with DPDK and vice versa. But I worked in the open source uh, to de-brand DPDK from Intel and work to grow the community. And this is where my personal experience and story comes in. So what I did at that point was, uh, I guess everybody has heard of Intel, right? Right, it's a company that everybody knows. Uh, it's a big company. So what happens when you're big? And when you have name, name recognition? You also are very proud. You also think that people will come to you. So um, I was hired to build community around DPDK and around open source projects. But when I went out into the community, what I realized in talking to the developers were, was that they saw DPDK as something that Intel was backing. They did not see DPDK as an open source project, a true open source project. So how many of you know a difference between an open source project and a true open source project? Why do you think the community was uh, hesitant to work with DPDK if they thought that Intel was behind it? Any guesses? Some stuff. Yes, so they thought that they would be logged in to Intel hardware and then, you know, they will be logged in precisely. And that is not what we wanted. We wanted to have the, so, starting, uh, like, you know, at the get-go, I started working with somebody in CAVM because they were building on DPDK. And our marketing and our, my managers did not like it because CAVM was Intel's competitor. But then, to me, it is open source. So I had to convince them that we need to debrand Intel with DPDK and not just debrand. In create a space that it is welcoming to other contributors into the community. So there were, um, so for example, there was a complaint by the community that any code that was contributed to DPDK was gated by one particular maintainer. And, uh, you know, so things were slow and people were not happy that their valid contributions were being accepted. So we put together things in place. So, so I mean, at a surface level, what we did was any time we talked about DPDK, we didn't use Intel slides. We had DPDK logo and we used DPDK slides for that. So that is a surface level thing. That's a branding thing, right? But then, what is the true thing? We need to get, we needed to get other contributors also recognized within the community. So, the, uh, so there is 
like you know again i'll come come to another story so so when i started uh, we we used to do dpdk meetups we used to do dpdk conference and uh, we used to invite 70% external speakers who didn't wear intel badge so we were recognize we started recognizing the community more and uh, in one of the summits uh, there were like you know key customers present into the summit and uh, they had questions regarding dpdk our sales team was trying to move them to dpdk for a long time but that was not happening and why that was not happening was because they had the same concern that uh, if they move to dpdk they would be logged into intel devices right so what we did was uh, we let the communities answer all the questions at the summit nobody from intel answered the questions and that convinced this particular customer that dpdk is now really a community effort and not just you know um, an intel project like so what are the so from the story that i have told so far what are any any things that pop out to you like any leadership traits anybody went to business school management stuff okay we're talking to bunch of developers <laughs> well um yeah i used to be one too um so uh, getting customers what do leaders do how do leaders grow in businesses that's what i learned basically I, i wasn't doing it because i wanted to grow at the time i was doing it because i thought this was my job i was doing it because i thought this was me trying to grow the community right so i was basically doing what companies have a role called pre sales has anybody heard of pre sales yes some people have heard of so what i was doing was pre sales really because once the customers is warmed up then we handed over the customer to the accounts team and the sales team and they made the final sale right but it was a very non conventional way of doing it um we were getting the customer feedback means from the developer community and then i was getting that message and getting it into uh like you know our leadership our management and convincing them that what i was saying was making sense and uh, how was i able to do it because when i started i will i didn't start as a manager or a leader i was an individual contributor so how did i convince them it was not about me it was about the community it was about what the community was looking for uh, has anybody seen a movie called uh, uh, seven angry men or 11 angry men it's a very old movie hollywood movie nobody is from america so um <laughs> uh, so that movie is about um ha- has is anybody familiar with jury system in america two people right so uh, what happens is in court room if there is any trial instead of a judge you have a set of jury who is listening to that you know the whole thing and uh, at the end of it the jury has to give a verdict guilty or not guilty so in this case in this movie there were like nine or whatever how many ever there are mm, jurors of huh? 12 angry men yes yes yeah 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 so th- everybody thought this person is guilty except one and this movie is about that one person convincing all these 12 people that this person is not guilty and this was this movie was shown to me when i did a leadership course course at stanford executive leadership course at stanford they were talking about how do you influence people in meetings has anybody have had that experience has anybody felt that you're in a meeting and you're not being heard 
a few people. So uh, basically what this movie talks about, always focus on something larger than you and me. So you're not talking about you or the other people in the meeting. You're talking about a goal that everybody can get behind. So when I was talking about the community, I was talking about the community. It was not about me. It was not about the management. It was not about inter. It was about the community. In the 12 Angry Men, when that person was talking, he was not talking about himself. He was talking about the person that they were going to send to the chair. So yeah. So when are the instances where you think you will have, you want to influence? What are the examples where you feel that people are not hearing you in the meeting? Yes. Any time that I mentioned that maybe you should, you know, support open source developers. Okay. Yeah. So what would be your argument? Yeah, that's a really good point. You already are working on this open source project. If you don't invest in it, that open source project may not thrive, may not be of good quality, and then you may have to migrate. That will cause more investment from, okay. What are the other instances where you feel that you're not being heard? It's okay, anything is fine. Sorry? Sorry, I, I, can you speak a little louder? When people are talking over you, okay? Yeah, uh, and when you're kind of trying to make a point that they don't like and they've got bigger voices than you, so, yeah. You're making a point that they, don't, they do not like? Yeah. Unpopular opinion, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah, so that's a generic example. So again, you, so that is another thing that, uh, like, you know, we talked about in the leadership course was, you know, know, know your audience ahead. So if you're going into a meeting, you feel that you know your there, are, there is going to be detractors. Maybe be the de devil's advocate yourself and, you know, think about things that people will say against whatever you are saying and then be prepared with the arguments for that and then again the arguments should not be about you but about like you know how you can get that and you know open source is a very good way of practicing that how nobody knows you in open source when you start contributing initially right you do work with a bunch of people who you don't know, possibly coming from different cultures, possibly coming from different backgrounds, not even speaking your language. You get to practice that, right? And uh, apart from the technical things, like how to grow in your career, when you're doing your salary negotiations, when you're talking about promotions, what is your manager talking about you? What is your manager's peers talking about you? So one of the ways uh, I rose in my career was because I was so much out there in, in the community. I was getting recognition in the community because I was contributing back to the community, giving them what they wanted. And so that's why my managers knew that I was being recognized in the community. So they wanted to keep me. Um, anybody? Felt that like, you know, at home nobody listens to you, but you go to a stranger and make an argument and they listen to you. No? <laughs> sometimes, like not always, but sometimes. Like, you know, at, at home you are like, you know, you're their kid or you don't know anything. 
but then you your classmate they they respect you more or you know your colleague they know you from college or like you know whatever they know you so sometimes you have to get a like you know one of your friends to talk to your mother to convince something or you know your dad <laughs> so it's something like that right so you the community is recognizing you will get you recognition in the company and if it is not then it's not the right company but yeah that's that's one way um so there are different ways in which you can practice in open source so leadership was one i talked about passion right so you are you, you uh, one of you said oh we're almost close to the time i think yeah uh so talent is another thing so like you know you are doing something in your job there's something else that you want to get good at you want to maybe shift to ai for example when i was working at open source i was working on networking software which was closely in, like you know integrated like cisco juniper etc but then i wanted to work in open source software in stn nfe so i used open source to start contributing and start learning and then eventually i landed up a job in open source right so you can use open source for a career shift for recognition and uh, whatever you are passionate about like today i'm passionate about green software my company is there but like it's not completely there so i try to contribute more into you know open source software that is in green so uh, yeah this is a open source uh, audience so i guess i don't need to talk about these examples then everybody knows him uh, the ai journey everybody knows right uh, so i guess i talked about uh, listening to the community learning from the community working as a team with the community and bringing the organization so when i started i was an individual contributor but then i built like things like developer summit meetups and i was giving you know our engineers and engineers within the community spotlight into those communities so i was sharing the spotlight and i was creating opportunities and that's why people were working with me because i was creating opportunities for them and these are just some spot like you know projects that were like you know started from very small to becoming very big in the next foundation while i worked so yeah i guess um, i took a lot of time in you know stating my story i hope i didn't bore you guys so uh there is you are at a open source conference there is no dearth of open source projects find an open source project that you care like before that find your passion think like you know that makes makes your eyes light up and then find an open source project within that well there are good open source projects there's not good open source projects meaning you don't want to be stuck into an open source project where nobody else is contributing you want to be in an open source project where like you know you have a good community thriving community people answering questions people community members from different organizations and then just start to contribute like i said open source is always strapped for resources so nobody is going to say no most open source projects are democracy and by the way contribution is not just code contribution could be ecosystem marketing getting new contributors different organizations into open source you can pra practice whatever skills you want to right in the open source yeah so make your voice heard like open sources most open source projects are meritocracy doesn't matter where you are how much you contribute based on that you'll get recognition and like you know if you are passionate about that project become an ambassador for that project and always include others so uh, from byte dance like i said earlier we have uh, 50 plus open source projects and we are looking for like you know people who want to work in those projects um so if you become part of our program we give you recognition access to latest software um 
it's open source, but like you know, uh, uh, whatever we, the next feature we are uh, you know releasing, you will get early access to it for your research, for your product development. There's case to case stipends and like you know developer spotlight. We do conferences and webinars, and we always want to highlight our developers in that. These are some of the developers uh, that we have uh, awarded in 2024. You can see they are from different parts of the world. We have, uh, you know, not a good gender balance. We want to work on that. <laughs> um, so this is one of our projects. Uh, I, I, I see I've run out of time, so I'll just like, you know, this is a uh, video uh, uh, processing framework, BMF. You can uh, you know scan the QR code and look at it more. So here, uh, BMF is integrated with an AI algorithm to uh, you know stream the uh, gen uh, using Gen AI to generate this panda image over a live stream. Uh, RSpec is a front-end uh, web development framework which like you know makes applications lightning fast. <laughs> Um, apparently, companies lose millions of dollars if their customers have to wait before putting items on the shopping cart. So RSPAC helps with that. Uh, vScale is an AI framework project uh, working on cloud. Uh, so instead of parallel, uh, working on a one single big device, you can work on smaller device, and vScale will parallelize your uh, algorithm on it. And it works with a lot of hugging face algorithms. Um, so in the QR code, you'll find the link for the meetup um, and for the innovator program, uh, my LinkedIn. So you know uh, we can have conversations after this. And that's it.